welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. We are especially fortunate today to have with us Andy Weiner, a longtime, very, very deeply revered, admired, and appreciated friend, lawyer, dispute resolution professional, former chief of staff for Senator Brian Schatz, who, as luck would have it, was my daughter's high school classmate, and now the consultant to the governor and the point person on the Hawaii Victims Compensation Fund for the Maui Fire Victims and Claims and the Community. Uh, and Tracy Wilkin, the longtime director of the Mediation Center of the Pacific, and both the head and the heart of the mediation community here in Hawaii in so many ways that have served so many people and continue to. Tracy, Andy, thanks so very much for joining us. Hey, Andy, let's start with a hard question. Is it possible for you to give us a sense of what the core values of the Victims' Compensation Fund project and work are? Yes, I think that's definitely possible, Chuck, and thanks for, for having me here today and for letting us talk about this important subject. Um, the beginning of the Victims' Compensation Fund um, really started on the day or two after the, the fire. Uh, the governor and I began having conversations about some of the issues that he was concerned about, both short and long term. And what became clear to me, at least, was that what he wanted to focus on was putting people first, that there were going to be many, many things that we were going to have to deal with as a state and as a, as a, as a community um, in, in dealing with the tragedy of, of Maui. Um, but he wanted to make sure that front and center in all of that were the the, the, the people, the victims that, that had suffered and had lost loved ones. And he wanted to try to find a way uh, to address their situation uh, first and in a meaningful way. Um, that is to some degree uh, in stark contrast to some of the other fires that we've seen on the West Coast in particular, where, where victims were largely ignored for large periods of time. Um, so that was sort of the, the beginning sort of data point. But I think over and above that is that um, not only from the governor, but from all of the uh, individuals that we've dealt with over the last few, few weeks and months has been a desire to make sure that we design a process that reflects the best of Hawaii, uh, that, that really focuses on the values that we have as a state and, and one that, that is seeking uh, to come up with a, a way to, to recognize uh, the responsibility of the state. And when I say that, it, it's not meant to be who was at fault or who is liable, but as a, as a state and as a community that we're going to step up and take care of people that are suffering. Um, and so as we proceeded with attempting to design a, a process to compensate those victims, sort of those two points, I think, have been uh, a couple of the things that have resonated uh, not only with me, but I think with all of the people that have been involved in trying to design a program that, that can actually help um, bring justice and to, to restore, um, you know, the way that the community has dealt with uh, these victims and how and how it is that as a state we're going to move forward. So those are the, the main philosophical uh, cores that we have, that this is going to be a program that, that may not look familiar to people that don't live in Hawaii, but I would hope at the end of it, People from Hawaii look at it and they say, yes, we're proud of that. And this is how, as, as a state, we're going to step forward and actually, you know, work to address what's happened as a result of uh, the fires in Maui. And you raised a really, really important insight that's unique here. How does the fact that this is unlike New York City and the California wildfires and the British petroleum oil spills, this is a single community with a unique cultural history, including as the former capital of the monarchy and a very, very strong Hawaii, Hawaiian component culturally, as well as probably the most diverse population of any of the disaster areas uh, in the U.S. history. How, does, how do those things impact how you look at and deal with this? You know, I, I, I think that we share a, a common mentor, uh, Justice Bert Kobayashi. He was one of the, the founders of, of Alternative Dispute Resolution in Hawaii. And I was fortunate enough to, to be what I consider a student 
of his when when I was first starting a career in uh, alternative dispute resolution. And Justice Kobayashi was always a, an individual that wanted to make sure that the the processes that we're that we're adopting in Hawaii were actually going to fit the culture of the state. He believed very much that that alternative dispute resolution fit in this state better than probably any place else in the country. And so when we looked at the set of issues that came out of the, the terrible fires in Maui, I kept hearing that voice in the back of my head that, that you need to come up with solutions that are going to be appropriate um, for the community where this happened. And that, that those need to be kept in mind as, as you're coming up with processes. And so I think every single time I think that I've sort of hit a wall where I didn't think we were going to be able to make progress. Um, you know, hearing that voice in the back of my head, but also hearing Governor Green saying, you know, we've got to put people first when you combine those two things. Um, you know, it's an awesome responsibility to try to make sure that we're representing what Hawaii, you know, wants to be and should be. Um, and I, I've tried to do that. And I know that the team that's working with the governor and frankly, the other parties that have been talking about it, I, I think that we've approached this uh, in, the, in the spirit of aloha. I think that there has been a, a great deal of effort made to be sensitive to the needs of the community and to come up with a set of solutions that, that are, as I said earlier, maybe a little bit odd to people that are not from Hawaii. But I think when we go through and explain them, it has very much a core of, of Hawaii and a very much a sense of the place um, where these fires took place. And so, you know, we're still working on some of the details, but I, I, I would say that, 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 you know, overall, when we've had conversations with others about what we're trying to do and conversations with people from Maui in particular, I think that we're on the right track. That's fantastic. And I want to get to the questions of what people need to know, but Real quick before doing that, just Tracy has the mind and heart of dispute resolution, collaborative problem solving, ho'oponopono in Hawaii. What do you see as the unique factors here that really deserve priority and to be part of the cultural values and principles that embed this work going forward? Well, as Andy mentioned already, you know, we have Lahaina, which is a unique community and a very strong community in itself. We've seen how they have come together and, and everybody throughout the state has come together to support them. But but as the community themselves, um, they want to be empowered uh, to help each other, to rebuild. They want a voice. And so dispute resolution processes um, give people that opportunity. And, and they have specific needs and desires, and they've been through a lot of trauma. So creating dispute resolution processes that enable them to address their priorities, to work through these issues at a pace comfortable for them, and to make sure that their needs that are important to them, not as us outsiders see them, are, are addressed through these processes. So I'm you know, happy to see that we're looking at how to design a variety of dispute resolution processes because there'll be different issues um, that will and can be addressed through um, a variety of processes, such as the one that's um, being rolled out right now by Andy and the governor. And that's really important to understand that these, these are not just people, these are human stories. I was in line at the way to shoe store yesterday and the gentleman next to me was from Lahaina. He had eight minutes to make it out and he made it out only because he knew all the back roads through the sugarcane fields and everything. The stories need to be respected. They need to be understood. They need to be honored because the stories are the people. That makes Hawaii unique. Hey, so Andy, what do people, hey, involved in, affected by the fires and the fire claims, what, what do they really need to know and understand most? So I think that there's a few things, Chuck, and I, I, I preface all of this by, by saying that on November 8th, the governor did announce that we were going to move forward with a, with a recovery fund and that we were working on, on fleshing out the details. And that is actually still occurring. And so 
and as as I talk to you today, there is not some immediate process that any you know victim or victim's family needs to engage in now. But I, I think that you know what we've tried to do is to give families a sense as to where things are going and when they're going and sort of what we're looking at um, as as we move forward. Our our hope is that um, sometime in in early to mid December, the governor will have additional details on the recovery fund as we finalize some of those discussions with the the various parties that are going to be contributing to the fund. But let me go through maybe a couple of the the main points that I think. Uh, hopefully reflect what I talked about earlier, that we're trying to devise a program that fits not only the situation as far as this fire goes, but also fits the culture of Hawaii and, and tries to, to, to reflect that in a way that, that allows victims and their families to, to have a certain amount of control over what they may want to do moving forward. So first and foremost, um, the, the, the fund, once it is up and operational, will be completely voluntary, meaning that if you look at what it is that the state is offering, um, together with the other parties that are going to be participating in that fund, that there is no mandatory requirement uh, for a victim or a victim's family to agree to that process. And, and there may be very good reasons why um, individuals look at what is being put forward and they may decide that's not best for us, that, that they believe that being able to go to court and having their day in court is the most appropriate thing for them. And as far as the, the state and the rest of the uh, individuals that have been involved in designing this program are concerned, that's fine. Um, we, we want to provide options and to allow families to decide what works best for them. So that's one of the core principles of what it is that we're looking at. The, the, the second core principle was to make uh, or to create a process and to make it uh, work in a way that would be expeditious and would be easy. Um, that that we didn't want to create something where all you were doing is essentially substituting an administrative process for a litigation process. So that what we want victims to be able to do and and their families is to be able to easily access an application form to be able to easily understand what it is that, that they need to do in order to access the fund, that they, they know the steps in order that they need to, to fulfill in order to receive compensation, and that there's also some opportunity, if they do not have counsel and want to get you know, advice, that there is a way to access counsel uh, pro bono. So when you put those factors together, I think that what you'll see when the program is put together is an announcement where you'll see something like a website with some very straightforward forms and also the ability to talk to the fund's administrator. Um, we're working to designate somebody that would be not an individual that is, is a state employee, but somebody that is outside the state. The, the fund itself is going to be uh, independently run by an administrator and will receive administrative support probably from a financial institution from Hawaii. And the idea would basically be that funds would be deposited in that fund, there would be instructions given to the administrator, but the administrator would have a fair amount of, of discretion as it relates to how do you go about reviewing uh, the documents, how do you go about uh, addressing and, and, and communicating with victims. Although we, we expect the process itself to be relatively straightforward. In other words, you submit your forms, you get whatever approvals need to come from the court, and then you receive your check and your compensation. And so hopefully, if we do this the way we envision, we see this process taking somewhere between six and nine months from the time that we open up the fund, as opposed to the years and years of litigation um, that uh, a victim or victim's family may be looking at. And once again, to go back to the beginning point, if that's what a victim's, or victim's family wants to do, then we are absolutely fine with that. But we wanted to provide them with that option. The last thing that I, I'm going to mention may seem a little bit odd, uh, but I think it's an important uh, point to make regarding what we're also looking to do. Anybody that decides to apply to this fund will have the right to be able to, uh, if they would like, present their story you know, to, the, uh, to the administrator. You know, Chuck, you talked in terms of like everybody has a story, and we we know 
that people that, especially those who lost loved ones, have stories that they want to tell about their family members, and they should have that opportunity. In some cases, that can occur in a trial, but in this setting where we're giving them the option to do something that's more expeditious, what they will have an opportunity to do if they choose to do so is to present that story to the administrator who will be more than happy to listen to them and to also, I think, give them a chance to explain the loss that they've suffered as a result of this of this you know terrible event that happened in Maui. So those are the main things I think that people should should understand. But I, I again, I want to make sure that everybody goes away understanding there's no deadlines right now. There's nothing that they need to do. Um, but we, we want to make sure that they're paying attention and we will do everything in our power to make sure that when the time comes that we're, we're communicating um, with, with those individuals that, that might be interested in, in accessing the fund. So we know that there are, for example, besides litigation, there are, and Tracy's our leading expert on it, mediation arbitration that can be done privately and confidentially. How does this program differ from, from such private confidential resolution processes? This program will be different in, in the following way. Um, the, what, would you, what you would normally see in a litigation matter, let's say, is that you would have a plaintiff and a defendant. You know, you might have more plaintiffs or more defendants, but you would have a legal action that is brought in court and a mediator might get involved to help try to facilitate a settlement between those parties. And they'll negotiate back and forth. Um, Tracy and Chuck, you're both terrific mediators. And so, you know, over a period of time, you know that, you know, that process, you know, sometimes can be long and sometimes it can be short. Um, and, and you need to, you know, spend the time that's necessary to get something done. This is different in that we're not really negotiating per se with the potential claimants into the fund. We're, we're setting up a fund. We're going to set parameters on the fund. We're going to set an amount of compensation that a victim or an individual might decide that they want to access, and then they can decide if they want to do that or not. But we're not engaged in a in a negotiation or a mediation uh, per se as a result of this of this process. It's going to be creating an opportunity for them to access funds. It'll be fully transparent in terms of what it is that that an individual needs to do to access those funds and what rights they might be giving up as a result of accessing those funds. But it is not a negotiation like you would ordinarily see when you're looking at a mediation. So that's that's the difference here. So what do you see as the stages and the people in different stages that you're anticipating serving? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that one of the questions that we had have had a lot from from the legal community, but the community at large is, well, wait a second, there's lots of other claims that are out there. You know, you're talking we're, we're talking about wrongful death cases and, and, and injury cases where somebody has been hospitalized or stopped medical attention. But there are obviously thousands of other individuals that suffered as a result of the fires. You have individuals that lost their homes, they lost their contents in their homes, they lost their businesses, their businesses were disrupted. And, and all of those uh, claims that are out there at some point in time will likely need to be addressed. And, and I think the hope of the state and Governor Green is that in, in some sort of like organized manner moving forward, that those claims will have an opportunity to be, to be resolved. Going back, though, to what I said at the beginning in terms of the philosophy behind what the governor is doing, he wanted to put people first. He thought in his, in his, his view was the people that are paying the ultimate price for what happened in Maui are those families that lost loved ones in the fire and those who suffered physical injury. And so this fund is going to focus on those elements and those claims. But we all recognize that there will probably need to be other Dispute, resolu dispute resolution mechanisms that are going to get created in order to take care of the other claims that I mentioned that are still going to be out there. So this fund is not going to address those. But I think what the hope is, and I think I'm seeing this as, as we are working together with the various parties that are part of the fund or who will be impacted by the fund, is that you're already starting to see that, that it's creating working relationships between those individuals. And I think hopefully setting the table 
for us to move forward as a, as a community to look at those larger and probably thornier set of issues that are going to be uh, coming down the line that we're going to have to address. And so those of you who are watching this who are mediators and arbitrators and facilitators, we're going to need all of you. Um, we're going to need to spend time with the, the community in Lahaina, but also up in Kula. We're going to need to spend time trying to figure out how do we uh, come up with solutions that fit the culture of this state? How do we figure out like what is an appropriate amount of compensation? And how do we do it in a way, hopefully by the time that we're wrapping this up, that, that, that we can come out of it thinking, you know, this was hard. This was very difficult. But as a family, you know, we sort of survived this. And so, you know, when we decided to call the overall program the One Ohana Fund, it was very deliberate because I think that we viewed that what we were doing, that this isn't just defendants throwing money into a settlement pot. This is sort of a family that is coming together in, in time of tragedy to, to work together to deal with the problems that have come out of, of the fires on, on Maui. So that's where, where I believe we're going. And, and you know, the two of you, I, I assume, will be among hopefully many that will be stepping up to, to work on the remainder. I, 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 I'm hoping that we're a little bit of a beacon, <laughs> that we're hoping, we're hoping that it inspires people to some degree, and it then sets the, the table for us to, to go ahead and, and, and look at what other process or processes are necessary to take care of these complicated claims. And that's a really, really important insight because we certainly know that there are some people and there are some attorneys that are going to want to go full on litigation. It could be years, lots of expenses, a very adversarial process. It's expensive, it's lengthy, it's hard on people. And the time factor here, there may be many, many people who don't have the time for recovery that those processes take. <clears throat> that how does your process and how you see it evolving differ from that and offer something that is more expeditious, more cost effective, more objectively, maybe neutrally assisted and managed? So I, if, if I understand what you're asking, Chuck, I think what, what we tried to do here um, you know, to address you know, what, what Tracy had to say, which is a really important point, is you have to you know, understand that individuals are going to view this situation differently. Not everybody grieves on the same schedule. Not everybody is going to be ready at the same time to, to want to you know, figure out how to engage with the legal system. And I, I think that when we started looking at this, the thing that we saw when we looked at, at some of the fires, for example, that took place in California, the element that really kind of made us really take a step back and say, we don't want to do that, is that in California, it literally took years before they got to the point where they were even giving victims an opportunity to, to resolve claims that they wanted to do that. And, you know, for some individuals, I think that they're going to want to move on. I think that they're going to want to have an opportunity to not be involved in a lengthy legal process and, and to give them that sort of control to us is in stark contrast to what we were seeing in California. You know, we're already starting to hear from some number of, of, of attorneys who represent some of the families of those who lost loved ones in this fire. And, you know, they are, um, they're not anxious to go and relive that necessarily in court. There may be individuals that are, that want to be able to go to court and to tell their story and to be able to explain, you know, why it is that certain parties you know, should be held responsible. And we again, we're not looking to take that away from them. But I think that what we wanted to do was to empower those individuals who did not want to go through that lengthy process, who don't want to wait three, five, eight years before something ends, to give them the choice so that they could decide among themselves what's best for us. And that element was not present in California. And when we were looking at, like, one of the things that we could do in the short term that we thought could have at least help to, to help heal some of those individuals was to make sure that they are not forced into that sort of process in order to, to seek compensation if they think that that's what they want to do. So I hope that's an answer to your question. But, but again, I think those were some of the, the elements of the, of the program that we wanted to implement 
and implement quickly so that we can give people options. And that, I think, is the hallmark of what we're trying to do, is to empower people to decide what's best for them. Well, and I think what you've just done that distinguishes Hawaii and this program and yourself, as I know you and Tracy, is that this is a people and community oriented, cultural value oriented process that is responsive rather than adversarially directed as litigation is. And that distinction is an important one here. Yeah. And, and, and I think that as we worked on designing this program, those, those sort of factors were in our mind. We actually wanted to come up with a way that we were not forcing people to put on proof of how much money their loved one would have made if they had survived, or what are the individual circumstances that, that differentiate them. I know people may want to do that. We want to give them the chance you know, to speak to the administrator about that. But we wanted to derive and to come up with a process that didn't require um, that amount of legal proof that you would see, for example, in a trial before a judge and a jury. We wanted to come up with a way to come up with fair compensation and, and to provide an easy way to access it in an, an expeditious way. That That is what really drove a lot of what we were trying to do, to give that option um, that would move along the process a lot quicker than I think any place else I think I've seen in the country, at least, you know, so far, especially for a, a, a tragedy of this magnitude. And what we're hearing is you're talking about something that is so classically core value connected to Hawaii uniquely, and that is a process based on people and that their connections, their communications are collaborative rather than adversarial. And so rather than the lengthy, expensive adversarial processes that can be divisive and really hard on people, I'm, I'm hearing that you're aiming for something that comes from and for the people that is more collaborative, that's more objective, scientifically evidence-based, that's more neutrally expert evaluated, that's assisted by Hawaii's wonderful resources like Tracy of trained, neutral mediators and people who can administer these processes in ways that are people-oriented. <clears throat> so how do you draw people to see and understand the value and benefits of that choice that you're offering as opposed to the litigation standard stuff? That's a, that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I, I think we've been talking about among ourselves is what is the best way to approach individuals that are potentially eligible to apply for this fund? I think that what we want to try to do is, is in all likelihood, um, do some sort of outreach uh, individually to those families uh, to find a way to talk to them either directly or through their counsel to make sure that they know what is there. Um, and to answer their questions um, in a private setting um, that gives them a chance to express their concerns about what it is that they're being asked to, to consider. Um, and so, you know, as, as we work on the next steps in this process, one of the things that we have talked about is what's the best way to reach the, the, the individuals that are, are likely going to be impacted and are going to need to, to know about what is there. And so we're, we're consulting at length with uh, individuals from Maui who are from Lahaina, who know many of the families that have been impacted by this fire, um, so that we can get their assistance to figure out the best way to communicate what it is that we're trying to do. So the governor may make an announcement, and I think that's very important for the public to know, but you know, I think as far as the the outreach to the individuals impacted by um, the fire who can apply, um, we actually want to get to the point where we're talking to each and every one of them individually. You know, we we could do in theory, I guess, some large community meeting, but I, I'm not sure that that forcing somebody that's lost a family member to come before a large group of people is really the the best way to allow somebody to heal. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we're going to look for opportunities to, to, to touch people one by one. 
the the thing about this first fund that we're talking about is we have a general idea of how many people we're talking about. And although it, it is a tragic number, it is also hopefully a number where we can actually have individual conversations so that we can explain what we're doing, answer their questions, and then let them make their decisions after they talk to their uh, family members, but also their lawyers if they want to involve them as well. We're not going to exclude lawyers from the process. And if people want legal counsel, that's fine as well. Well, and what we're hearing, which is unique to and culturally and emotionally and spiritually grounded in and appropriate to Hawaii, is what what you're putting together, the core values of it, are not the go tell people this is what's going to happen and see which side can impose their selective viewpoint or results on the other, but the ask and offer process that Andy Weiner and Tracy Wilkin, two of the best I've ever seen in my 45 years at doing this, is are building something to approach people to ask, what are your interests and priorities? Help us understand that. And how can we put something together, design and offer it? that's going to be of the most help and service. And with each of the groups, not only the victims and those affected, but the people who are being targeted as responsible. We have a utility that, whatever your view, has contributed huge value and played an incredibly crucial role in the development of this state. And going forward has even a more core value responsibility as we shift to renewable energy, to community-based energy programs and projects, Kamehameha Schools, which, whose role is hugely important to children, to families, to learning, to communities. All of those people, your ask and offer approach, what are your interests and priorities? How can we work with you to put something together to best serve them? in as expedited, as cost-effective, and as fair a way as possible. That, I, I think, is unique. That's not what 9-11 or the BP oil spills or Roundup were. Those were litigation developed or litigation avoidance processes. So if you build it and they come, how will you help them get there? So I think that, you know, what we talked about earlier was that, you know, we're trying to come up with a process that simplifies what an application looks like. We hope to have a website that is relatively straightforward, has relatively few documents that will need to be completed. Um, we will have the administrator um, available to be able to talk to, to individuals who apply or their counsel to answer questions. I think I mentioned earlier that we expect a financial institution to not only be holding the funds, but to be providing administrative support. And I think what our hope is, is that we'll have a number of staff members that are trained who can answer the kinds of questions that, that people will have. On the website, we will have frequently asked questions so that they can take a look and see, you know, for the most part, hopefully we've anticipated the questions. And if we haven't, there'll be a way to communicate with the administrator and the people that are running the program. And then we'll also, I think, you know, do some outreach with the plaintiff's lawyers. Obviously, some of the individuals that we may be attempting to access the funds are going to be represented by counsel. As I said earlier, we're not seeking to exclude them. We're seeking to include them. And to the extent that they are um, going to be assisting with the, the preparation of documents to access the, the claims uh, or the claims fund, you know, we're going to make sure that that similar to individuals, if they need to talk to the administrator or somebody that's administering the funds, that there'll be an opportunity for them to do that. So, you know, I, I assume that, you know, the governor, you know, knowing just how he is personally, um, will actually, I think, do some of the, the individual outreach. Like having a physician as a governor, um, you know, in a situation like this, I think is incredibly helpful. He has he has, for lack of a better way to describe it, a great bedside manner. Um, and I think, and I can see that in certain circumstances that he will be a great um, communicator for us to be able to, to talk to people about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. But, um, you know, we're also open to other suggestions. If, if, if anybody has thoughts on 
the best way to to publicize or to make the the program um, available generally to the people that are impacted, you know, we're 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 all ears. We want to make sure that people are aware of it. They have a chance to ask the questions, and then they can make a decision on what's best for them. And Tracy, I wanted to ask you. Tell us a little bit about what dispute resolution resources, which Andy has indicated are going to be integral to helping to convene and manage these communications and processes. But what kind of resources and people do we have here and how might that be of value and service to this resolution process system? Well, Chuck, as you know, you and Andy are being uh, some of the top dispute resolution experts in the state. We're very fortunate here to have a strong dispute resolution community. We have five community mediation centers throughout the state um, that have a large cadre of skilled mediators who do a lot of amazing work. We also have dispute prevention and resolution, which is the largest for-profit dispute resolution program in the state who has an amazing panel of mediators, arbitrators, facilitators. And then there's a lot of other independent people out there. And there are individuals who have the skills who I know would be willing to step up to the plate to assist that are already working in the community in a variety of ways who have learned the skills, even though they may not you know, have the label of formal mediator facilitator, but they've gone through the training and they have the skills and they're able to use them. So, um, you know, I, I feel hopeful and excited that as we look at each of the areas and the issues, you know, from insurance claims, residential, commercial, to uh, landlord tenant issues and the variety of issues that need to be addressed, um, that we can develop processes and that we will have the appropriate dispute resolution resolvers be able to step up and assist. Um, and and I, I know that people are ready, willing, and able. It's about looking at each of the issues and making sure the appropriate information is gathered to um, adequately and correctly address those issues in the process that's designed. And the, and the key element, you know, each process may, may look a little bit different um, as the program Andy has been describing, but the key elements is people will have choices. Um, they're empowered in the process. They have a voice. Um, and that is so critical right now. I mean, I, I can't imagine um, going through the trauma. And um, as Andy pointed out, you know, everybody deals with the trauma and what they've gone through each in their own way. And we need to be respectful of that and build processes that are respectful, um, whether people are participating with attorneys or whether they want to participate on their own, um, having appropriate um, language interpreters, if English isn't their primary language, um, having members of the community who they trust um, participate with them so that the processes that are designed are comfortable, um, they're welcoming, and they empower them to have a voice and to have choices. Um, and I know as, as we look at each of the issues and, and the timing is appropriate and designing that we will have uh, many members of our community in the dispute resolution field who will be willing to step up and assist. And that's a fantastic vision. How do you and what is your confidence level that that can be done in ways that are really cost effective, affordable, low bono, I think is the word you've used, um, for many of these claims are not going to have a bunch of money for them. Now, you've got death and injury claims that it may be million dollar claims and lawyers are going to look at making money off those things. But there are a lot of others. Out there. What if there's no insurance or not enough insurance? for the home or the business or the vehicle. Um, what about if it's a problem like, oh, I lost all my documents, my immigration status, my family status is jeopardized, my employment status is jeopardized. What if I'm, because I was economically devastated, I'm at risk of foreclosure, eviction, landlord tenant problems and issues. How do we, 
help design the people and the processes to be able to comprehensively welcome and respect and deal with all of those in a not only expedited, but cost-effective manner, affordable manner. Ideas? Those are really um, important points and are going to take a lot of people um, coming together, a lot of key stakeholders to talk about the issues and what it takes to design the right process. Um, in some instances, as you say, it'll be you know, having adequate funding. And I, I know the state, the governor is looking at these issues now, where where do the funds come from um, to support people in these different situations? Um, as far as the the people assisting with the processes, the the neutrals, the dispute resolution um, professionals, I think a lot of them would be willing to to do the work pro bono. I don't think in every situation in and it depends on the, the issues, as you mentioned, Chuck, if, we're, if it's a landlord tenant issue, you need individuals who are versed, not only skilled facilitators and mediators, but are versed in landlord tenant matters, similar to eviction and the information that's needed um, to help people make informed decisions and negotiate needs to be pulled together. So it is, it is going to take a village. Um, to look at all these issues and make sure that the information that's needed is there and available um, and that the right dispute resolvers are there. And I and I want to say, you know, I it will take a lot of work, but I know it can be done. Um, when we went through COVID and there was a moratorium on evictions, you know, there was I know a lot of us came together, you know, whether it was attorneys, it was legislators, it was judges, um, members of the community talking about what's going to happen when that moratorium ends and the concern that there would be thousands of evictions. And so similar, although this is much bigger, um, you know, we looked at what kind of process can we design to help landlords and tenants because landlords needed help as well as tenants to come together, be able to have a process that empowered both of them to negotiate, to have outcomes that they needed. Um, and through those discussions, Act 57 was created. Um, and for one year, uh, mediation was required when tenants and tenants had the choice. They didn't have to mediate, but landlords were required to participate prior to the eviction process. And as a result of that, it was really the five community mediation centers throughout the state that put the program together um, once Act 57 was in place. And as a result, um, there were um, more than 1,500 landlords and tenants that were able to reach agreements where payment plans were worked out. You know, Tenants were be able to remain in the residence, landlords were paid. Um, and it was developed quickly, respectfully, and, you know, we reached out to a broad number of dispute resolution professionals um, who did it low bono um, and did it successfully. So, you know, based on that track record of success and how many members of the community stepped up to make it work, I, I know in my heart that we can design processes um, to help the people of Maui to be able to make choices and be empowered in a time that they must feel um, very out of control and having no power. So creating these processes just gives them a little more control in their lives to help them be able to make a choice to um, address issues sooner so that they and their families can decide what their next steps are. Um, and that's so critical right now. And you've raised a point that really is an especially thorny one, particularly for the, the entities that have been targeted and, and sued here, is it, you've got an incredibly difficult causation situation with very, very high winds, 50, 70, sometimes 90 miles per hour, together with very flammable grasses. and utility poles that were aging, that may have been energized, that may have contributed to initiating fires, 
And you've got a whole bunch of other factors going on. And you've got a lot of evidence that's gone, destroyed in the fires. <laughs> Andy, how do you connect the funding and those really difficult causation allocation issues among those parties? So that's a very sort of difficult part of the, the, the work that we, we've had to do over the last you know, few weeks. The, the challenge has been that we're, we're seeking, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is to move quickly. We're trying to, to actually stand up a program um, you know, before the end of the year, that's four, four or five months after the spire took place. And one of the difficulties is that, you know, we don't have the benefit of, of discovery from, you know, from a court case. And so we're, we're, we're not able to, to look at depositions or look at documents. Um, and so, you know, we, we recognized that early on that was going to be a problem. You know, we're not, we're not able, you know, to to maybe provide some of the analysis that would make parties comfortable. But I think there were a couple of things that were driving, you know, the 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 the, the conversations that I think have been very productive. And I think some of that related to um, a shared desire by some of the parties you've mentioned, um, together with Maui County, um, that that. We, we understood that maybe this wasn't going to be like a perfect process, but let, like, let's not make, you know, the perfect, the enemy of the good. And so, you know, among ourselves, we, we were pretty candid in terms of how we looked at, at liability at this point. I, I can tell you that, that that was a factor, but it was by no means the only one. And I think that, you know, the, the parties that have been at the table, you know, not only were, were looking at, um, you know, who's right and who's wrong, but all of them, I think, early on wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to come up with a process that allowed these victims and these individuals to have an option to make a decision. And so I hope that when we make the announcements as to where the funding is going to come from, I think we'll make it clear that like, in no way, shape, or form is anybody saying, okay, this is how this is going to be for every other process that gets designed moving forward. I think that there were circumstances relating to wanting to move quickly. I think that, you know, the parties, I think, were listening very closely to Governor Green's leadership on the idea of putting people first. And so there have been some hard conversations. I think, you know, everybody um, has their own views, I think, in terms of how they might advocate if they were in court. But I think for the good of of the community, the good of the state, people have put that aside in order to try to come up with a solution that provides options for those individuals that we think are the ones that that really should have an opportunity to, to have their claims addressed first. And so, although liability was certainly part of the discussion point, it was by no means, I think, normal the, what you would normally see if it was a case that was in litigation and you've had a bunch of discovery. Um, I think that there was a, a desire to see, you know, these people get treated fairly. And so, you know, the, the various contributions that are being made, I, I, I will tell people, are not necessarily reflective of how any of us necessarily view how a case might ultimately play out if it goes to trial. Well, and you've raised a really important point. We don't want to get off into the weeds of legalisms, but the joint and several liability factor in American law, very different. In Britain, right, if, if you could figure out hey, party A, your X percent, party B, your Y percent, party C, your Z percent, that's how it's going to split up. We don't have that. Hey, if A has 75 percent liability, but only enough money to pay for 10 percent, the other 90 percent is going to have to come from B and C, even if they're only a smaller portion percentage liable. So that factor, as you as you wisely infer, drops out. And the, the idea of working collaboratively to preserve the long-term viability of all the entities, how do we keep and motivate the utility to play the role and have the viability to be what Hawaii really needs it to be in energy? How do we do that with Kamehameha Schools in education and community outreach? How do we do that with other parties, with the state, with the county of Maui? 
Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 is exactly what we tried to do over the, the over the course of the last you know several weeks is to recognize that 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 you know there were certainly like I said there's an, there's a legal overlay here, but the the four parties that you've identified obviously are core entities in this state. I mean, <laughs> the state of Hawaii, Maui County, you know, our largest electric utility you know, our largest private landowner and also our largest charitable and philanthropic institution. Those are major, you know, entities in the state. And I think that, that in the conversations that we were having, that there was a recognition that there was a responsibility that, that, that transcended, you know, things like liability or insurance coverage. I think what we tried to do is figure out, like, it was almost like, what, what can you do at this point in time? You know, let, let's figure out what is doable at this point in time and make it clear that it may not set precedent for things going going forward. I mean, Maui County right now is obviously dealing with a terrible tragedy. Its government is is overwhelmed and it's doing, I think, the best it can under unbelievably trying circumstances. And so to to burden them in a way that they would not be able to take care of the direct needs of their people was something that the state in particular wanted to make sure was being looked at and addressed. And I think when you see how it is that compensation was derived for this pool, I think that the state looked at it as, you know, we feel a responsibility to everybody, but we want to make sure that the county and the county government is able to function in a way that it is able to do the rest of what needs to happen in the coming years. And so, you know, that's one example, I think, of, of, of how it was that we were sort of viewing all of this, that, that there certainly was some awareness of, of, of what happened relating to the fire, but that we all knew that there was a, 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 a larger and greater and important uh, goal that was in mind here, which is we're putting people first, we're putting this community first, we're coming up with a way to, you know, address their needs in a hopefully an expeditious way. And we all understand, by the way, that there's going to be criticism of what it is that we're doing. There's going to be people that are going to say the state is paying too much or he goes not paying enough or whoever else is involved. We're going to hear all of that. And I will say that, you know, maybe it's not perfect. I, 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 I will not be so egotistical as to think that that is the case. But I do think that what we did come up with was a fairly, we're coming up with what I think is a fairly elegant solution to a very, very difficult set of problems. And I think that in a year from now, you know, my hope is, is that the people that have been involved in this will look back and, and view it as some of the best work that they ever did in their career. And that we did something that, that you know, set a standard for how it is that we're going to like go forward as a state and as, as one family to be able to address what happened. So those things have been very much going through my mind, but I think it's also been clear, all of the other individuals and entities that are there, I think have come with that sort of spirit. And, you know, I commend our partners that are gonna, you know, be willing, you know, to do this. This is hard. I mean, the people that are making these decisions are going to be criticized and yet they are willing to go forward. And I think that that is courageous, but I also think it's leadership in a time when the state desperately needs leadership. And so hopefully, as I said earlier, this becomes a beacon for how it is that we want to come out of this and that we come out of this crisis feeling like the people of Hawaii came up with a solution that fit the times and fit the, the place and fit the culture of the state. That's what we're trying to do. And my hope is that, you know, we'll show the way. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not going to be perfect. But I think I think it's going to be a reflection of, of of something that the people of this state can be very proud of. And I think what you've just encapsulated, maybe better than anyone I've ever heard, is that what really makes this unique and distinct from all the others and from the litigation stuff and all that is this is a coalescing, a collaboration of people realizing that the only way to get through this as intact as possible each is to get through it as intact as possible all. And, and to understand, respect, and honor each other's 
ability, value, and importance to each other to be able to do that. You folks are doing that in a way that way different than 9-11, British petroleum oil spills, out of any of those. This, 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 is, this is in many ways more complicated um, because of the fact that, that in some of those circumstances, you had one party that was being looked upon to, to provide compensation. Here, we have many that in, in, in principle and in you know, legal theory may, may actually you know, need to be involved. And so almost by definition, we, we ended up having you know, you know, entities that work together and know each other. But they they are working together in sort of different ways, and we're trying to get them. And I think that we've succeeded in 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 speaking with one voice. That's that's where we want to get to. We all understand that we have different interests. We all understand that we have different pressures. But I think that the the, the that what we tried to do was put those down at the at the at the door. Walk in. Let's sit down at the table. Let's figure out what we can do that's going to be meaningful and important for this state, and actually address. The needs of the people that are most in need. So that's that's what we, we we attempted to do. And I would commend the others that were part of this. This wasn't just the governor. This was the mayor. This was this was Kamehameha Schools. This has been you know Maui County and the mayor. And and so you know I as I said I I expect that not everybody will look at this and stand up and cheer. Um, but in the end, I, I I think that we've come up with a with an approach that that. You know, in in a few months, when we give individuals the choice, I think I think they're going to choose to participate. A lot of them will, and I think that I think that they will be, um, you know, some of the first people that will say at the at the end of all of this that that we did our jobs, that we 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 gave them what they needed to be able to get on with their lives in a way that that they could control. That that's what we wanted to get to, and I I think I, I am hopeful that we'll hit that mark. And what I love about the one Ohana name, I don't think it could be any better than that, is it recognizes and honors, yeah, perfect to Hawaiian culture. We come into this as one Ohana. The only way and the best way to get through this and out of this as resilient, as intact, as able to go forward with our best lives and choices as possible is as one Ohana together. You folks are doing that. Andy Weiner, Tracy Wilkin, two of the best of the best at not only enabling that for people in conflict and in disasters, but modeling it themselves professionally and personally. Two of the finest people I've known, role models for me in my 45 years of doing this stuff. And Tracy, last thoughts and words? Uh, Scott, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh be here with you and Andy, and I'm uh, looking forward to watching as the process moves forward. Andy, last thoughts? Thank you for having us, Chuck. I'm looking forward to working with you and Tracy moving forward. I think there'll be a lot of uh, opportunities to do that. Thank you for the opportunity to, to you know, describe what we're up to and for your interest in this. And uh, as I said, stay tuned. A few weeks from now, I'm hoping, you, you know, we'll be able to, to show a lot more. And I, 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 I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say when we do it. And, and I want to, with and for all of us, take that message and, and pay it forward because I think we all want to thank not only the governor who has exemplified, this is what an emergency physician does in an emergency. The patient comes first, the patient's family and support group are the critical element of recovery and all the other resources have to be one ohana to get through it. That's exactly what you folks are doing and exemplifying. And however one may view responsibility, liability factors, things like that, and the Hawaiian Electric Companies and Entity has for a long time contributed huge value and needs to be able to continue to contribute huge value to this community in order for us to come through it as one ohana. That is certainly equally true of Kamehameha Schools. It's equally true of the state, of the county, and of all of those who are impacted and affected. And I think we'll finish by saying there are none of us in Hawaii who are not impacted and affected, some more indirectly than others, but 
if you're impacted in a way that when you're really thinking about this and hearing what Andy and Tracy are working on trying to ask and offer here, tears will roll down your cheeks as they are mine. Thank you, aloha for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. One ohana. Thank you.